As many of you know, I'll be going on sabbatical for two months in just a few days' time. And it's been more than 20 years since I last had this long a break from preaching. Preaching is remarkably more difficult and more taxing, I think, than it appears. In fact, when I asked some colleagues to fill in for me while I was away, uh, some of them just said no. Some said yes, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but some of them said no. And the basic reason was simple. It was going, because it's hard and it's a lot of work to prepare a sermon. Uh, and just to say, by the way, for those who worship with us online, is, um, is that some of the guest preachers will be making videos and some of them won't. And for those Sundays when there isn't a video, uh, our office will be uploading an old sermon of mine. So I hope you'll continue to remain uh, faithful watchers as you are of our channel. But many who listen to sermons, I think, are unaware of, of the listening and wrestling with Scripture that a preacher endures, of trying to settle in the midst of that wrestling on a God-inspired idea. What is the Lord saying through this Scripture? Of sorting through thoughts and in, including and excluding some, of constructing and of editing, of looking for illustrations to make the point and so on. I remember at my previous church, one guy thought I just made the sermons up on a Sunday uh, as I went along. And I'm not sure what this is about my preaching, but uh, for me, sermon, sermon prep can be a lot of work. Uh, it often, a sermon often has three drafts, and uh, not uncommonly it might have six or seven uh, drafts as we try and sort through the thinking and the listening. And of course, COVID's added the, the additional challenge of preparing a word for this environment, for being online. Uh, some of you I've never met or do not know, and yet we preach and you are here, and we're so glad that you are. And I really want to say, in the midst of all of that, one of the greatest privileges of my life is to be a preacher. Uh, and I know that one day when I retire, I will miss the privilege of being able to speak regularly to a community of people. But for now, I want to say how grateful I am to have this time away, to have time to let my soul breathe, to be able to read scripture without looking for a word, is there a sermon here, to be able to just listen to the Spirit um, and to enjoy the comfort of God's presence uh, as I move around. I'm looking forward to two months in which my relationship with God is not wrapped up in some kind of work. And so today's sermon, it's no different from any others, but if I can say for me, at a personal level, today's sermon is significant because it represents a moment in which my public voice will be quiet, even though it's just for a short season, that this public voice, this public privilege of being able to speak the gospel uh, is suspended for a while. And so for two months I will move from being a preacher to being a pilgrim. Uh, and, I've, uh, and I look forward to that that sense of silence, uh, not in the monastic sense, but nevertheless that sense of quiet, of speaking less. So when I came to today's word, um, which is from the lectionary passage for today, uh, I asked myself, I wonder what word I can leave with this faithful faith community to which I belong. What blessing uh, might I speak over this group? And I wanted to be guided by the post-Easter um, scriptures. And I think the word for us, and it's familiar, but I think it's an important word for us to hear, is I want us to know, because that's what our passage does for us today, I want us to know that Jesus stands among us. Jesus stands among us. And when he stands among us, his first word to us is peace. And it's a very particular peace. It's not an empty peace. It's not a platitude. It's not a there, there. It's not peace, peace. It's not even a, which is interesting because this phrase comes up often in scripture, it's not even a do not be afraid. Jesus' first word is peace, but his first action is to show the disciples his hands and his side. And not only do his wounds identify him in the story, but they actually give weight, they give direction, they give understanding to his greeting of peace. The wounds reveal that the peace Jesus speaks over us is rooted in his own suffering, which means that the peace he speaks over us is the promise of peace for us, even in the midst of our own suffering. And it goes further than that. His wounds tell of his victory over death, 
of not only being with us in our suffering, but also of his victory, his triumph over death. And so this peace that Jesus speaks over us is the peace which assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I am certain that that would have been this thinking that would have inspired the Apostle, the Apostle Paul to write those famous words from Romans, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. With his wounds, the first word Jesus speaks to us is peace, a very particular, powerful peace. But then, surprisingly in many ways, Jesus speaks peace again. He says the word again. Uh, let me read it to you quickly. He's, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And then it goes on to say, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So now there is more to this peace than the comfort of knowing God is with us. And obviously that comfort is hugely important. But there's even more to this peace than knowing that. The peace Jesus speaks is also ascending peace. So Jesus breathes on them and says, which is a beautiful picture in itself, but Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And as we read in our passage today, when Jesus breathes his spirit upon us, it is never simply to give us a spiritual experience. Jesus breathes his spirit upon us so that we may go into the world in the same way he did. I wish I could preach more on that, but he, we are sent into the world as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So we are sent into the world with all the things that were true about Jesus' life. And you can put that together, especially in the in the, the days immediately after Easter. So we are sent into the world in the same way he did. And, and we are also sent with this very interesting phrase, which we won't get into in any detail today, but we are sent into the world to proclaim forgiveness, to speak grace into the world, to bring life into the world. It's a comforting peace, but it's also ascending peace. I'm not sure if you follow the story of this escaped prisoner, Tabo Besta, the allegation is that his girlfriend, who is a medical doctor, stole three bodies from a mortuary so that they could make it look like he had been burned to death in a prison fire. And I'm not sure what the other two bodies were for, but we assume it was for backup. And you think about how horrendously depraved that is to steal bodies in that way. But we also have to marvel at the gross immorality which would allow three bodies to be removed from a mortuary and at least one of them to be smuggled into a prison. It takes more than one person to do that. And I know those kind of dramatic stories like that feel so far removed from our world. But I want us to understand that the peace that Jesus brings to us and the peace that Jesus speaks over us to send us into the world, that that peace must matter. Because the world we live in can be both bad and mad. And we are called to go and do something. And what Jesus sends us to do may seem small. I know I feel like that. I go, so, I mean, what little can I do? What can I do in a world that, that's, that is that mad and bad that people are stealing bodies? But, but this passage comes to us today and go, we dare not give up working and praying for a better world. As the people of Jesus, the people of the risen Jesus, we dare not give up working and praying for a better world. Because Jesus has spoken and he's declared his peace over our lives, his peace of comfort, but his peace of sending, his peace of going. And then there's one other little nugget in this passage that I want to leave with you today, if I may. Uh, our reading began with these words. When it was evening on that day, 
the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. In other words, the Judeans, the Judean leaders. Jesus came and stood among them. So it seems, it seems, we don't want to build too much on it, but it seems that John is saying that all of these things that happen in our story today happened in the room where they had all met together for the Last Supper. And in the trauma and bewilderment and hearing what was really incomprehensible news that Jesus had risen from the dead, it was hard for the disciples to get their heads around that. The disciples returned to the room where they had last been together, where they had last been with Jesus as friends around a table, where in a sense life had last been, even though it was a very intense evening, where life had last felt a bit normal. And then, aside from that, we then hear the bit which is the passage that mostly occupied with this, the bit about Thomas. But what for me is notable in the story about Thomas is that we're told that Thomas wasn't there the first time, but then this group meets again in the same room just one week later. And Thomas is present this time. And it made me wonder, and I wonder if it's too much to wonder, whether a pattern has already developed here in this little community of faith. If there isn't a habit, a ritual, a practice, a discipline, that on a weekly basis at least, the friends of Jesus come together and meet, and that as they do, Jesus comes and stands amongst them. And I want to say, I think I'm living with that because that feels like a truth for me, that as quickly as that, from the first day of resurrection, Jesus draws people to himself. It's what happens, Jesus said it would happen, it's what happens when Jesus is present. People join together around Jesus. When Jesus is present, people will gather around him. And so some of the work of the church is to ensure that Jesus is the center of all we do. Uh, it is easier to ignore Jesus than you would imagine. Because it's Jesus, you would think we couldn't ignore him. But we can. He's, he is not forceful. And so we can have churches where Jesus isn't central. We can have churches where Jesus isn't recognized, where we just get on and do our stuff. But in places where Jesus is exalted, where he is held at the center, he will draw people to himself. And we will be in community. Uh, it, we will be. When Jesus is present, we will be standing around with others because it's what happens when Jesus is present. And so as I bid you farewell for these two months, my prayer for all of you is that you will know Jesus standing amongst you in power. And that in these months, you will, you will sense Jesus breathing on you. That you will sense the power and the presence of his spirit with you. And that you will accept, you will embrace his, the authority he gives you to go and speak grace and forgiveness into our world, wherever you are. It doesn't mean you have to go across the seas, just wherever you are, to speak grace into your world. Speak life into your world. And so I thank you for your love, and I thank you for your prayers as I go. And may God be with you until we meet again.